Started my career actually on the Northern Daily Leader in the, in, in Tamworth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when I was uh, 16, we had work experience at school, and uh, I wanted to be a draftsman. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I thought I would give that a go. And I spent two weeks writing the architect's name on his plans. Came back to school, and um, one of my mates, he had spent um, 14 days at the newspaper as a photographer. And he said, oh, I was at the motorbike races, and I went to the zoo and saw a baby tiger being born, and I went to the water polo. And that sounded pretty exciting. So my sister was a journalist on the newspaper, so I asked her if I could spend my summer holidays with the photographers as a work experience, and which I did. And then I was bitten by it. So basically set up a dark room in, my, in the wool shed out in, uh, Dunga out in uh, Mildorn Lane in uh, out of town and uh, worked with my dad, built up a portfolio, got a job in Brisbane and the rest is history. And I was a photographer for many years. Uh, I went traveling, I left, I left Australia when I was about 20, 21 and went to Asia. Travelled around there for a while, met a Danish woman, moved to Denmark, was there for 35 years. Four years ago, moved back to Australia, kids were growing up, thought I'd want to come back to motherland, which I'm very, very happy for. So glad to be back in Australia. And, um, and so I was pendling backwards and forwards to Denmark doing my photography. I kept a lot of my clients over there. And then one day, COVID hit. So I couldn't jump on the plane anymore, couldn't do my job anymore. I've always kind of seen myself as, when I'm an old man, I kind of imagined myself as an old man with a long grey beard, like looking really healthy and really young and vibrant. And people say, what, what are you doing? So I'm living off my own food. And so I saw myself living in a little house with a garden and I was just eating my own food. And then, so COVID started and um, this dream, I saw, I thought, well, this is a good enough time to start this long-term dream I had. So I started the garden and I used my camera gear filming what I was doing. And that's what started the YouTube channel. And um, it was called The Weedy Garden. And um, I, I soon became known as Mr. Weedy or Uncle Weedy or Weedy. So people know me now as Weedy. And I go down the street, people say, oh, hi, Weedy. Um, so that's, that's basically what I'm doing these days. Um, I just released a movie, which is like a... Like a um, a summary of the last two years YouTube channels is called Down the Carrot Hole. Um, we showed it at the, at the cinema last night. Uh, how many was at the cinema last night and saw the movie? A few? Okay. Well, you can still see the movie. You can get it on Vimeo or just search Google Down the Carrot Hole or you can get it from the Weedy Garden website, weedygarden.com. And so, um, so here we go, and suddenly I'm sort of a little bit half famous, and, and, and people want to sort of meet Weedy, and, and, and so this is the first time I've ever been invited to do sort of any sort of public speaking, and all my life I've been an observer behind the camera, like secretly watching people and so on. So for me to be in front of the camera, uh, in front of everybody, is sort of a bit unnatural for me. And so um, Nina was very kind to ask me to come and talk, and I said, yeah, okay. So I didn't prepare. <laughs> didn't prepare anything. Um, so I thought I'd just see how it goes if I just sort of be spontaneous and, 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 and live. But um, my, my YouTube channel is, is really, mm, how can I explain this? <clears throat> I didn't know anything about gardening when I started my garden during lockdown. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I used to have cauliflower, like a cauliflower veggie garden. I'd put the seed in the ground, I'd water it, and I'd harvest my cauliflower and put them on a trailer on the back of my bike and cycle down Meldon Lane and, and sell it to the neighbours. But other than that, I thought you'd put a seed in the ground and it would grow. I had no idea what the soil was and how important the soil is. And so my YouTube channel is my sharing of my enthusiasm and my amazement at this wonderful story that I've just discovered and if I can maybe try and put that into words now what that story is it might help you understand um, when I was young I used to wag English class to go to the dark room I was much more interested in visual things than in words so my my language is kind of very limited so when I'm talking it's kind of like I've got to kind of make pictures of things <laughs> I'm trying to explain but anyway um, so this, this story that I think is really important to share is that story of, um, well, this, this I, I see the, the soil as like the stomach for, for plants, right? 
So if we just bring it right back to the beginning. So when we eat food, we put something that used to be alive into our mouth. It goes down into our system and the bacteria break, break all that down. And then the nutrients that are broken down go through our stomach wall and into our system. And it's pretty much the same thing that happens in the ground. So the, 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 all, the dead stuff falls on the ground and all the microbes and the bacteria eat it. And, um, and the, the roots is like the stomach wall uh, our stomach wall, the, the, the roots is like the stomach wall for the plants. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, we could. I kind of want to. I want to kind of get into. I want once I get into it, I can get into it. I just got to get into it. Um, little question. Oh, well, Mm -hmm. um, when, did, when were you kids, Kevin? I'm just yeah. have a look at here. Yeah. Um, do you appear on it? Yeah. Do you talk on it? Yeah. So you are able to do it. I am in front of the camera as well, yeah. And, and, and you can. Uh, so it sounds very interesting. Um, it's like this one's live and I don't have any second chances. <laughs> But um, with, uh, with my camera, when I'm recording, it's like I've got my camera, I go GoPro, start recording, and then I can just blabber and blabber and blabber, and I can cut out what I want to put in, right? Say the same thing again and again and again until it sounds good. Um, usually I have a, I don't, yeah, usually I have something specific I want to say on camera. Um, but <clears throat> let's get back to this story that I think is really, really interesting. Um, and it's really hard to put in words because the, the, what I, I, I kind of see this film happening in my mind and I, then I have to kind of tell you what's happening on the film in my mind for, for me to ex explain what's going on. Um, but I, I, just think, I just think what I discovered at the age of 54 was like people need to know this from school age. If I'd known, if I'd known now... If I'd known now, if I'd known when I was little what I know now about how I see plants and how I see the world, it would have made such a huge difference. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just, I kind of go back from the beginning if I can. So let's just, let's just talk about nutrients and this, like, this cycle of life of, of how everything runs around. Right? So we've got the periodic table. Everyone knows what the periodic table is. It's like the table of elements. And if you just imagine that all the elements on a period periodic table, uh, like just imagine that each one is a little Lego block, a little Lego block, different colour, different shape, different size, so carbon that might be a little yellow square le Lego block and potassium might be a little long purple one, right? So if you imagine something when it's, so you've got earth, wind, water and fire, these are these elements, um, so earth, that's all the minerals, uh, wind, that's oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide, Water, that's water, that's that's how everything gets transported. So if you've got a little a little carbon molecule, it can't really move anywhere without water. So water is the transport, and fire is the sun photosynthesis, the sunshine. And then you've got the spirit, which is the life. So you've got all these elements, and when life comes into into play, then something's growing. Then something is composing. So it's making itself out of all these Lego blocks. So it's if it's a plant, it's finding this little, oh, there's a little carbon molecule, there it is, boom, it sucks it up into its roots and it starts to grow itself. And so it's constantly doing that and it's just constantly building, sucking all these different Lego blocks out of the soil to become itself. And then when it dies, then the process of decomposition begins. So if you think about a, a little Lego um, Star Wars thing that's sitting on the, on the, on the windowsill, it's all been constructed, the little boy grows up and leaves home and then, and then we're going to pull apart those Lego blocks and put them back in the box for someone else to build something new out of. Okay? That's kind of the way I see how the process of life works. From a seed, because life, life doesn't start. Life has always been life. Life doesn't start. Like the life doesn't start in the seed because the seed's still alive when it's, on, when it's in the fruit and it's on the tree. And when it lands in the ground, it's still alive. And um, so this whole process of life is quite interesting because everything's always been living until, until it dies. So <clears throat> you've got a little plant and it's, um, it, it's extracting these Lego blocks out of the soil that it needs. Just the same as an animal does. An animal eats food and extracts the Lego blocks through its stomach wall which it needs, right? So that's why the soil is like the stomach for the plants. So everything's growing, it's composing, 
it dies and it gets decomposed. And what, decom what does the decomposing? Does anyone know what does the decomposing? What kind of microbes? The fungi and the bacteria. There are only two, there are only two ones that do it. They're the only two organisms on the planet Earth that can take the Lego blocks apart from the spaceship and put them back to be reused again. So, <clears throat> so you think, oh, well, an earthworm, that, that decomposes. No, it doesn't. It eats the stuff, puts it in its gut, and then the microbes, the bacteria in the gut of the earthworm do the decomposing. And if you, if you think about anything that's living, it's built up of cells, right? Just think of it like a little, like a little Malteser. Everything's built up of Maltesers, right? And when something is decomposed, that malt, like, the plant food is in the Malteser. If you can imagine the Malteser is like a little ball with a little, with a little, little cover around it, nothing can get to it yet. The only thing that can break that little Malteser open to release that soft, yummy stuff inside is the bacteria or the fungus or the fungi, right? So it's the bacteria that's doing the breaking down. So that's why the soil bacteria is so important for the soil because if you put a rotten banana on the ground, it's not going to decompose until there's bacteria or fungi to do that. Okay, <clears throat> so that's why there's so, so when you go, ah, okay. So we got dirt and we get a plant and we've got nothing around for miles and miles it's just except dirt. There's no grass growing anywhere. You put the plant in the ground and you go, there you go, you're in the dirt, I'll give you water and sunshine and go for it. And it's going, well, there's no Lego blocks in the soil. It's just all mineral and dirt because there's no microbes, there's no soil life to do the work for me. So the tree's standing there going, I've got nothing to eat. Ah, oh. so, okay, so we've got a forest and we've got all these trees in the forest and all the plants and all the spiders and all the bugs and all the birds that are pooing and all the feathers that fall down and the frog that dies and its eyeballs down there, all these things on the bottom of the forest floor that have all died, they're all being decomposed. And so that's what's feeding the forest. The forest is feeding itself, you know what I mean? All the birds that it's attracting and all the insects that are attracting and leaves are falling down. That's what the forest is eating, so it's eating itself. So that's when we get this monoculture and we, we get a field and we plough it all up and we wreck all the mycelium and we wreck it all and we destroy the whole city. It's just like a big tsunami coming through Tamworth. Imagine it just wrecking all the buildings and all the infrastructure. We can manage and we can, we can rebuild it and, and we'll, we'll do that. It takes us a while, but we'll eventually rebuild the town. It's like what happens when you plough your field. It kills everything and you plant all your plants and, um, and, it, and there's, there's nothing really in the soil anymore. So the farmers have got to put fertiliser on to feed it. And then the plants grow and then it grows and they take what off they want to eat. They chop everything else off they want to use and bale it and leave the soil empty again. So the soil is not getting fed again. The stomach's not getting, there's nothing coming into the stomach anymore, you know. So when I understood that's how, that's how nature works. So you're driving along and you see a valley and you see the sun and the water and the shape of the things. Oh, look, it's all green down there and all the plants. It's because that's where all the, all the things are landing, you know. Um, so that's how I see, so when I come up to my garden, I'm kind of, I'm kind of more interested in all the, all the animals under the ground in my garden. That's what I'm looking after, because if they're looked after and they're fed, then it doesn't matter what I put in the ground. I mean, if it's the right environment for it, you can't plant bananas in Tamworth because they'll die of frost and so on, but, so that's kind of how I see the system, it's like feeding itself. So when I make my compost, what am I doing? I'm just putting a bunch of dead stuff in a pile, adding some bacteria, so they're going to break it all down. Okay, that's how it works, that's pretty simple. So once you kind of see it like that, it's like, oh, you know, if I'm going to pull out my weeds from the garden and chuck them away somewhere, it's like I'm, I'm depriving my garden of food. So everything that comes in my garden, on that little property, on top of my hill, the sun's coming down and it's just going and I eat some of it and then whatever's left I put it back on the ground again to feed the ground and because the sun is producing like it, it so it's like it's it's not going to run out it's going to be constantly producing and coming back in the soil. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of the way I see or, 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 organics that's for me that's what organic means 
It's, it's part of the cycle. It's part of the real cycle. It's the plants eating. Like, <clears throat> you've got the forest floor with all the dead uh, animals and feathers and everything like that. Uh, I, I see the supermarket, I see, I see the soil is like a supermarket. And if you've got a bit of seaweed, a bit of comfrey, a bit of hay, a dead cane toad or two, and all these different things mixed in, you've got calcium in bones, you've got the potassium in the eyeballs, you know what I mean? You've got all these different elements in all the different parts of the plants and the animals that are being decomposed. So the soil is like a, a supermarket. So you put your plant in, the roots go, okay, I need a bit of this. Oh, it's over there. And the fungus will say, it's over here. And the root will say, I can't really reach it. And the fungus will say, it's okay. I'll hang on to your root and I'll go over here and I'll grab it and I'll give it to you. That's how, does, it, does anyone know that that's how the like mycelium work under the ground? It's kind of connected to the plant. The plants, the plants um, this beautiful process of how it all hangs together. The sunshine hits the leaf. Sunshine turns to sugar. Sugar comes down to the roots. And it's like, I sweat, sort of like salty sweat. But the plants, they, their roots, they're sweating. It's like sweet sort of sweat. And the bacteria, they love the sugar. When you make bacteria juice, which I'll show tomorrow, you feed them molasses and they multiply. So bacteria and fungi, fungi love the sugar. And the plant knows that. All the plants know that. And they put the sugar out so the bacteria come close to the roots. And, oh, I'm going to eat a bit of sugar. And they eat a bit of minerals besides the root because that, that little area around the root is called the rhizosphere. So, because the, how the plant eats is like this, that it goes, hey, little bacteria, I can see you've been eating a banana in there and you've got banana, like the Maltese has been broken and it's inside your gut right now, little bacteria, and it's come over here. And the bacteria comes over to the root, oh, a little bit of sugar. And the plant, it's got these little, mm, the, the roots can actually suck in the bacteria. It actually sucks in the bacteria into its root and hits it with a bunch of nitrates and stuff like that, which kind of dissolve that, that Maltese, like the, the shell of it. And then, oh, then the, the potassium then goes into the, into the root. And then it sort of, when it's finished with that, it sort of spits it out again through the hair, little hairs on the root. It goes, thank you. Some of the bacteria, they can go, oh, shit, that was, whoa, that was an experience. I'll build a new shell and I'll go and eat some more bananas. And some of the bacteria, they die, unfortunately. Um, so, <clears throat> so that, I think that's really interesting as well when you kind of know when you know how that works. And and um, I, I'm kind of being a bit random here, kind of talking about all sorts of stuff. But I'm kind of sharing what I think is interesting. And um, and <clears throat> this Canadian woman did a really interesting experiment. And um, what she found out was that um, you got a mother tree, you got a big forest, okay? And the mother tree's there somewhere. And she goes, oh, she she let some seeds fall down into the forest. And a little seed lands on the forest floor and it goes, oh, you, you little beauty. And it goes, oh, it's like, shit, it's dark. It's dark down here. I can't get any sunlight. I can't produce any photosynthesis. I can't produce any sugar. I can't attract any microbes or bacteria. And the mother, she goes, I know. And that's why the mycelium is going to help you. So she, her roots will go down the mother tree, big roots, and the seed is like way over there. Mother's roots don't reach her, but the mycelium grabs onto the mother root, grabs onto the baby root, and pumps the sugar, the, the, so the photosynthesis coming down the mother goes into her roots, through the mycelium, into the baby, and then the baby can survive. And the baby sits there in the forest and, and gets fed by the mother, basically, until it can get up through the canopy itself and then get the sun itself. And they, they, they show, she showed that by, she went to the forest, she chopped down the mother tree, she came back two years later, all the baby trees in the forest had died. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the way nature works is incredible. Um, I did study permaculture. I wouldn't say my channel is like permaculture, like full on permaculture. I didn't really know what permaculture was when I started my garden. I met by chance one of Australia's most prominent permaculture teachers, Jeff Lawton. Anyone know who Jeff Lawton is? And um, so he, his, and he's a permaculture teacher. So he, a lot of his uh, t teachings kind of went into helping me do my my garden and my food forest. Anyone know what a swale is? Anyone doesn't know what a swale is? Okay, a swale is um, so you got you got a hill like this, right? It rains here and the water goes whoosh, down the hill and then it runs into the creek and into the ocean, and with that nutrients as well. So what a swale is, you got the hill and then you, you dig a trench along the hill along the contour of the hill. So Imagine the hills like that, 
you dig a trench going that way. So when you dig the trench and you put some water in, the water's going to stay in the trench the whole way along because it's level around the hill. You know what I mean? And so when the water comes down, it goes and hits that trench. It doesn't continue down the hill. It hits the trench, stays in the trench and sort of seeps in the soil and then goes into the ground underneath. So if you look at the hill like that, and then you've dug a trench in. If you look at the, if you look at the, the hill and the trench, you've got the hill, but you've dug a trench here and you put the soil here and then the hill continues down here. You know, see what I mean? So the water sits in here, sort of seeps in here and goes down underneath here. So, so you're planting your, your, your trees and stuff on that, on that ridge around the hill. So the, the, the moisture sort of sits in the soil and then sits and seeps down underneath the, is the berm, it's called, is the mound. Um, so I, I put swales in my garden and um, this whole idea of support species as well, you're like legume trees, you've got a mango tree, put a mango tree down, and it'll start to grow down, its roots are finding its way through the soil and it'll, uh, but if you get a support tree like a, um, anyone know what I mean by support tree, like a legume tree, Com uh, not so much companion planting, support trees like legume trees like um, uh, like, um, huh? A pigeon pea or popcorn cassia or anything that's got um, a legume, legume kind of trees. Just do a search on the internet and like search legume trees. But these trees, they grow a lot quicker. They grow quickly and they're nitrogen fixes. So they're putting nitrogen in the soil as they're growing. So you've got your, your mango tree and right beside it, like this far away, you plant another tree, which is a fast grower it'll take up and shadow your little mango tree. But that's good because your mango tree doesn't want to be sitting out in the direct sunlight. It'll get burnt and so on. So it needs a canopy. So that, that support tree will be its canopy for a little while. And as it's growing out, you can chop, you chop the limbs off and you just chop them up and then put them underneath, the, 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 underneath the, around the roots of the mango tree as it's growing out. So you're kind of feeding. So that tree is kind of feeding the mango tree. Three, four years go by, this quick growing tree has gone vroom, vroom down in the ground with its roots. And after about seven years, you go, thank you, cut it off. And all these ho holes that is left, all the roots, they rot. And the mango tree goes, oh shit, look at that tunnel. I'll take that one. You know what I mean? So, so the support tree helps open up the soil, helps make pathways down into the, into the ground for it. So that was another thing that I learned from permaculture. Um, there's a lot of aspects in permaculture, like there's the society part of it and the economy part of it and all that sort of thing. But the, I'm more interested in plants and how to grow plants, when, what plants like, and, and all the other aspects of politics and community and stuff. I'm not, not so much. I haven't taken that part of permaculture because I'm more interested in how to grow food. <clears throat> um, but um, I think when I started growing, I didn't know anything about it. Um, but I actually started my garden. Remember, remember online when we saw those videos online about people freaking out and then, about toilet paper? About the toilet paper was running out and people were freaking out? You remember that? Yeah. I remember it so clearly. And I remember sitting on a bench up, in, up on the hill and I'm thinking, shit, I wonder what it will be like if actually it was not toilet paper, but it was the food that was not on the shelves. That's going to be seriously serious. And that's when I said, I'm going to grow my own food because I don't want to be part of that. But I don't know how to. But that's when that instinct kicked in, you know. Anything you ever want to know, it's, the information's already out there. And if you tune in your tuner to, okay, this is what I want to do, this is how I need to live, this is how I've got to survive, what do I got to do? I want to know put your message out to the universe, you'll, you'll bump into people, you'll fall over them, you know. And so that's all the information I've learned is through that desire to learn, that search for knowledge. I want to grow this and that. So I ask, how do you grow it? Have you ever grown it? No, not really. Have you ever grown Oh yeah, I grow them every year, I grow these beautiful, how do you do it? You know, go to the people that know and learn from them. The YouTube channel has been amazing too because I do something and then people will comment, oh, do that, do this, do that. And it's like I'm learning so much more by having my, my channel. Um, so it's a wonderful learning experience for me and I, it's a wonderful sharing experience. I, I, like, I like sharing cause, because I'm so new to it and I, and I hear something like the support tree and how the roots make the path. It's like, oh, that's interesting. I bet other people think that's interesting. 
So I'll do a little video and explain that in a video and put it out there. Sure enough, people think that's interesting and people are learning. And I love that I can use my photography and my photography skills to, to, to be part of this change in human consciousness to, 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 to open up people's awareness about how important food is for our body and for our mind and our well-being and our emotions. It's, it's all connected. If you eat shit food, you're going to have shit mood, you're going to have sh you won't, you know, shit focus and, and you eat good healthy food with the right Lego blocks that your body's asking for, you'll feel the difference and that's really, really important and a lot of people don't know that. So um, I'm kind of just sort of fumbling along through my YouTube channel and suddenly I'll figure out, oh, that's, ooh, that's interesting, I'll do a video about that. And kind of that's what the Weedy Garden channel is. And, um, and um, I'm up there on the hill by myself, Heather, my beautiful partner, Mrs. Weedy, she's there sometimes. But, um, but usually it's, it's I'm by myself, like I'm up here talking to you guys and there's certain things I, I won't say or there's certain things I won't do because I'm in public and so on, but I'm up in the garden, I've got no shoes on, I've got my tie pants on and I'm up there and it's nice weather and GoPro start recording, say so what do you reckon and you know, and I, I kind of, I, um, I don't have any um, yeah, organisations behind me, I don't, I don't have ABC saying you can't say that, you can't say this, you can't do that, you can't do that, I'm just totally being myself, being totally honest and being totally open and, and I think people really like that in, in my channel. So, so I've been asked to come here today and talk about that, and here we are. And um, so um, I don't know if there's anyone got any questions or anything they want me to sort of maybe talk about or something, because I'm just sort of rambling here. Um, well, I'll ask questions, but they're not really about... Um, have you talked to schools and little kids? Because they just love them. Really. Yeah, well, uh, this movie that, that I made is called Down the Carrot Hole. Mm. And um, the movie is basically the story of this guy, me, who used to be a photographer and I focused my photography life has been focused on inspiring people to reconnect with nature. So, you know, I'll get, I'll get asked, oh, can you come do cigarette ad somewhere in Ukraine? No, mate. You know, can you come do sort of um, some video about our beautiful new tyres that we made for the four-wheel drives? No. Can you come do uh, something about something that's got to do with the earth, with something? Yeah, that's, that's my job. So all my photographic career and my film career, I've been sort of focusing on how can I get people opened up for nature again, you know, because I grew up in Dungowan in the country and, and for me, and that's what I say in my movie, when I was little, I remember kind of feeling this, feeling I'd be alone in the bush, but I'd always feel like something's watching me, you know. I don't know if you know what I mean by that. This quietness, this connection, this sort of like, beautiful space that I can't really explain what it is. And I go to the city, I move from Tamworth to Sydney, and I'm talking about this and people going, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? People from the city don't know what I mean. And so that's when I sort of said, I'm going to use my photography skill and I'm going to try and show what I mean. So I've been doing that for 35 years now. Um, and, um, and so the movie, um, um, you didn't see it yesterday? No. no. Um, well, it's basically a story about the photographer who locked down, toilet paper crisis, made the vegetable garden, learnt permaculture, made a beautiful garden with help from his community, and then thought, I wonder if I actually could survive in my garden if the shit hit the fan, I wonder if I could. So I stayed in my garden for two months and only ate what I grew, and I ate my own weight. And when I'd eat my own weight, I thought, okay, I can do this. And that was kind of the end of the movie. But in that, I met Jeff Lord and, and I made a sweat lodge for my, for my fiance and we did a few other things. But I'm going to cut it down into a children's friendly version of like 40 minutes, which is basically that story like I told in the beginning about the microbes and the Lego blocks and how that works with beautiful imagery. There's a wonderful uh, microscopic filmmaker in Poland that um, I found on, on YouTube and he has done all the beautiful microscopic photography in my film. Um, yeah, so I'm going, to make a, I'm going to make a children's version for that because I think, like I said in the beginning, if the kids are taught how to look at the earth and how to look at soil and, and plants and food, like I do now after I first saw it when I was 54, I think that's a really good thing. So, so I'm going to try and market my film to schools and so on, yeah, when we get that far. I think your skills also, your... The way you described, I don't know whether that's in your film, 
Do you mean the way I talk like this and stuff? Absolutely, it's in my films. That's what the film is. Yeah, come in. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, man. Talk about weeds. Do I want to talk about weeds? Uh, sure, I do. Um, a lot of people think, a lot of people will think, and I thought myself. So you got your mango tree, and you got that in the middle of the paddock, and it's getting covered by getting covered by weeds. And you think, oh no, I've got to take all those weeds around the root area, so it's only my plant that's eating. That's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. The only this is what I'm thinking. This is not what I know, but what I'm thinking is that. See, each little green leaf is a solar panel that's creating sugar for that, for that system underneath the soil, right? So the more green, the more solar panels you've got on the top of the ground, the more sugar you've got under the ground. Doesn't that sort of make sense? Right. So you've got your little mango tree and you've got all this dirt around it. And so the only, the only solar power is the mangoes that's coming down. So in my mind, the more weeds that are around the plant itself, and I did a little experiment. I dig a mango tree in the ground in my garden and I dug a big area and I put hay all around and everything and then I just got a shovel and I went <coughs> mango tree, <coughs> goodbye. And the little mango tree that's sitting there in all the weeds actually was the one that survived. The one in the hole didn't survive. <laughs> but um, my, my interpretation is that like in my garden, I've got, um, I've got my vegetables and my fruit trees and all that and then you've got some weeds that come up and they're big, like big thistles and stuff. I take them out. Um, you've got big grasses and stuff, depends on if they, the, the problem starts in my mind, the problem starts when they're fighting, they're fighting for the light. When the weeds are, are taking the light away from the plant you want, then we've, got, then we've got a situation with the weeds, then I'd take it out. But if it's not, if it's not taking the light away from the plant, I'd leave it in because it's putting sugar into the, it's, it's feeding the micro world. And the more, the bigger population that is, the better it is. So, um, and the weeds in my garden, I'd pull them out and leave them on the ground again. I never, I never clean my garden. Uh, if I do, I put it in the compost and then that compost comes back on it again. But I don't ever leave my soil bare in the garden. So these people that sort of think, oh, I've got my row of cabbages and my row of onions, I'm going to weed all the weeds in the middle and it's going to look so choice. I mean, I, I guess if you're feeding, if you're feeding and you're fertilising and everything, yeah, I don't know. It's a tricky one, but when I see when I when I when I see, that's the way I see weeds. I don't see weeds to be uh, fighting for the nutrients. I think there's enough, there's more than enough nutrients in the soil f for everything. It's when they come up and start shadowing for your plant, and that's where I see the problem. So you never add any fertilizer. Uh, I absolutely add fertilizer, but only the stuff I make myself. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to show a couple of demos. I'm going to do some workshops of how I make that bacteria juice I call it which is basically lactobacillus bacteria anyone know what lactobacillus bacteria is no. two people no. all right yeah well that's the that's the bacteria in the ground and in your gut as well they're the ones that eat the the Maltesers so I breed I breed them I make them by the trillions and um and then I pour them when I make my so when I make my compost I get all my bananas and my poo and, and not my poo sometimes Human manure, it's good for the garden actually. We won't get into that. Um, so your manure and, and all your things and you put them in your compost but then you get your bacteria juice and you pour it in. And that's basically, you're pouring in a bunch of empty, uh, hungry bacteria that are all going to eat and fill up their gut. So when you, pour, when you put that in the garden, you've got all these bacteria with all the stuff in the gut ready to be eaten by the plants. You know what I mean? Um, so and I make I make the same fertilizer by you make your lactobacillus bacteria and then you get a bunch of bananas for example or comfrey or something like that put them in the bucket and the bacteria will eat that away and then you you pour some into your watering can and mix it with water and, and pour it on. But is it human excrement with that sort of bacteria? Um, well, the, actually the ray, the earthworm gut is the most. If you look in the planet and say where is the most concentrated place on the planet of beneficial bacteria. It's inside the worm gut. That's why worm farms are really good. I'm going to show you how to build a worm farm as well tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, that, so I, I, I don't fertilise. I put compost on. I make my compost. I'm constantly making and turning compost. And I just basically feed my, my beds compost every, every time I plant something. I put a big handful of compost around it and 
And my garden beds are such, let's just say this is my garden, one of my beds, this table. I've got a cauliflower here, I've got a bit of onions here, I've got a tomato here, I've got a pineapple here, I've got an eggplant here. It's, I don't have rows of anything ever. Because the, the, bugs, um, the, bugs, the bugs and insects and predators and stuff that's going to get your plants, you've got to understand that it's like on the, on the, in, in the savannah in Africa. Well, you've got the lions there and they're going, okay, let's go and get some food, guys. Bunch of zebras over there. They're not going to go for the big, strong, quick zebra. They're going to waste all their energy running after it. They're going to look for the weakest one. That's, that's the smartest. Save their energy. It's easier to catch. So they get the weakest one. It's the same as the bugs. They'll fly around because the plant, if it's a healthy plant, it's, it's got things called pheromones and chemicals and stuff that it pumps out into its leaves that keep it protected. So the bugs will come and go, mm -hmm, and the plant will go, uh, and they'll go, oh, taste it. Terrible, and they'll move on. But you get a weak plant that's not hasn't really, uh, and it's not pumping out those pheromones. The bugs will go, oh, this one's not very. He's not, uh, you know. So a healthy plant, you won't get bugs. And if you plant all your stuff in rows and you get bugs, then they'll just keep munching away through the whole row. So that's why I plant this here and this there. And I got so if I want a cauliflower, I say, oh, is that one ready yet? No, that one's not ready. I'll go. Oh, is that one ready yet? No. So so everything's spread everywhere. So if something does get attacked, like if my brassicas do get attacked by grubs, then this one might get attacked by grubs, but the other one over there is fine, you know. Um, so that's what I call companion planting. But I don't, know, I don't know what plants are good to plant with other plants, except the ones that you kind of know, like basil and tomatoes, and you know, that's a companion, so, so the, the basil keeps the bugs away from the tomatoes. But other than that, I, I don't know anything about companion planting. Except the kind of way I observe in, in, in nature, you know, nature's spread out everywhere. A bunch of seed and whatever comes, all different. And that's my, my garden's kind of like that as well. And I've got stuff growing all the time. So my garden, any day of the week, any time of the day, I can always come in the garden and I can fill up a bucket of food. Any time of the year, any time of the day now. So I've got pineapples coming on sometime, I've got bananas coming on sometime, and I've got different sorts of spinach trees, so although my silver beet's not working because it's drought or whatever, I've still got my spinach tree, you know. And um, so that diversity, I think, is really important, just diversity. So any, any, at any given moment, there's always something to eat. Doing a lot of pickling and fermenting and drying and stuff like that. It's really exciting, getting really into it. I really love it. How many people here have got their own gardens, own vegetable gardens? Yeah, so you know that joy of eating your own food, especially like the first pineapple you get from your pineapples, you know? Two years, oh, and bananas. I did a video recently about my bananas, and um, uh, the first video I did, I said, well, these videos are not how-to videos, because usually garden, I never looked at any gardening channels, by the way, when I was doing my first video, because I didn't kind of want to get, oh, how do you do it? I just did my own, and, um, and a lot of the gardening videos are sort of how-to and how-to and how-to. And I understand why now, because that's the algorithms and people search how-to, and that's how you get the views and so on. But in the beginning, I didn't say, I said, these videos are not how-to videos. These are more inspirational videos. I just kind of want to share my enthusiasm of watching plants grow and how they react to human care and nurturing. And, um, but then, yeah, three years down the track, <clears throat> I made a video on bananas, because now I know a fair bit about bananas. And... Um, Oh, I just lost my focus totally just now. Don't you just hate that? Um, bananas, uh, something about bananas, and uh, oh, I lost it. Damn. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't about that. It was, um, oh, geez, sorry. Don't come back. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like. Take two and GoPro start recording. So what I was saying, no. Um, Wendy, I'd like to ask you, it, it sort of strikes me that what you're talking about is we all need to have a little bit of less control in our gardens. We all need to relax a bit. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, when I drive through the streets and everybody's got their green bin out for bin day, you know, my feeling is none of that stuff should be leaving your property. You, like, that is if exactly, you've got a garden. It's like throwing out your good stuff. And, and maybe I'm liking gardens that are too much about control and neat rows and about planting on a hedgerow or something. So, I'd love to ask you where you think we're getting it wrong as a community and as a society. What do you see as the as um, the thing that we can change to have a, a better uh, community for plants, animals, and biodiversity, yeah. in urban areas? Well, I think um, the only thing that can change that is your is your perspective. 
of what it is you're actually doing. Um, like I, I kind of see once I kind of once I saw that story of how it works, of what plants eat and how they eat and so on. Um, I, um, yeah, I kind of felt sad that you know, oh, I've got a banana peel and I'm going to chuck it somewhere. Oh, I don't want to put it underneath the plant instead, you know. So the, the, that manicuring kind of concept and stuff is, is kind of like very human because we want everything to be kind of, you know, when I cut my beard, I don't make it grow on the side. It has, you know what I mean? It's like it, humans, it's kind of like a human character, I guess. You want to kind of have order. You want to kind of show this is my garden, this is what I created. I think, I think the majority of people are not actually observing actually what's actually going on, you know, like the whole fact of feeding the plants. So when they weed the garden, they're all oh, going to make it nice and neat now and take all the weeds out and just leave the bare dirt. And then my plants, doesn't it look nice? And, um, and well, it does, but it's, it's, not, it's not kind of going with the system. Um, when I moved into the house that we're living in now, the, the woman who lived before us had one of those gardens, you know, and looked after and everything was raked and everything. And when I came in, I started, when I did the pruning, I just chucked all the branches underneath the tree again. And now it looks like a total mess, you know. But the plants, I look at the plants, how you going, guys? Oh, great, we're great, we're great, thanks. You know. So it's kind of like, it's, once you understand, once you look at the system of what does the nature want to have, and then do what the nature's asking you to do, then you'll do it differently from what you want it to do. So all I can say is that anything that's going to change is like the perception of the people, I guess, you know. And, you know, I see a lot of, um, you know, places in the cities where there's like just grass and parks and there's so many, so much space to grow food. It'd be, like in Asia, there's mango trees growing all over the place and in, in, by the sides of the road and in parks and there's the food kind of growing naturally all over the place. Kind of miss seeing that in Australia. But I don't know what's going to change. I don't know what, what, what needs to be done for it to change or whether it should change or whether it's for me to say that it has to change or, or not. I don't think about it so much. I just kind of like just doing my own thing and doing, I think, <clears throat> I think what I can do with my channel is, is kind of put my opinion in there and then let people watch that and maybe they can start to see things from a different perspective through, through my work. 